Welcome in to Between Two Meeples. I am Armando Castaneda, and today I get to talk about Rogue Angels Legacy of the Burning Sun. This game was designed by Emil Larson. It has already been successfully funded on Kickstarter by 1,900 people, and Late Pledge is currently open. So today, I do not want to go over gameplay and some of the other stuff because there's about 17 other videos that do a really good job at overviews and pictures and everything like that. Like, they do a great job. I want to go over the four things that stuck out to me while playing this game and, you know, that might interest you if you are contemplating whether you should late pledge or not. So if that sounds interesting, stick with me because I'm going to hop into it now. One of the first things that I truly enjoyed about this game is how easy it is to set up and how quick the actual, you know, campaign chapters are. You know, most games, when I think of like campaign games, like it's the big box Gloomhaven. It's like these big things where I feel like it's going to take me three hours to get through one campaign where even in this prototype, I can pull the prototype out. I can set the prototype up. And I feel like I'm up and going and putting everything back away within about a 90 minute time period. It is not that difficult. Uh, the campaign book itself is set up really easy. You can see here, you got your mission briefs. You got some reading to go through. It has really good pictures of how to set everything up. So that was one of the things that I really enjoy is like, you know, do this, get your little door, put it right there, get your door, put it here, put your POU here. Your team starts in these squares here, go. Success. What do you have to accomplish in order to be able to successful? Or what happens if you fail it? Boom. Really easy. Turn the page if you succeed. And then like it just continues to be super easy. It gives you some backstory of what's going on. And then gives you another mission to go and do. The missions flow quickly. And some missions you have like two or three objectives in them. And some of them, you know, it's only one. But then after you're all the way done, you go through here. You get these fancy updates and then you get like an aftermath. So then now you get to choose, you know, question. Did you blah, blah, blah. Did you eliminate anybody? Did you do this? You know, did you blow all this stuff up? If you did, you know, you get bonuses for it. And I really enjoyed the way, you know, the campaigns were written and how quickly they were and how everything was, you know, timed. You have four or five. You have a time track here. Everything went quickly. I think the longest one that we had in the first like seven or eight only had like max of 11 moves that we were able to do it before we had to fail. And in a two player game, you're just going back and forth. Everyone's talking in a solo game. It's even easier because, you know, in a solo mode, you one person is playing two characters and you get to choose. It's not that difficult. You can get through these campaigns super quick. You're constantly going through them. And that was one of the things that I really enjoyed, you know, having that mindset of going into uh, this is probably going to take forever or you know how long is this thing going to take or how long is this going to set up or how difficult is this thing going to be and it truly was you know on the easy side it was quick it was you know wasn't difficult everything was labeled the iconography was great so all in all like i really enjoyed the game the wife really enjoyed the game because of how quickly this campaign game was that was the one that was the first thing that I really enjoyed speed time ease that all positives in my mind the second thing that I liked about this game and it was about how the bad guys interacted with you when they were on the board now mind you I probably just grabbed two bad guys and just whatever was set up already and what happens is is you have these behavioral attack cards over here and these behavior attack cards have like what to do. So if you have this red guy here, he's the only one on the board, he's going to move to the nearest player. So if our players are on the board, like so over here, after I took my turn, this guy's going to move three spots, you know, one, two, three. And then if he can do damage to me, then he will do damage to me. And if there's more red guys, then they're going to go to, you know, more distant places. So they're going to go to the other people. They're going to they make it so that you don't quite know who exactly is going to get hit, who exactly is going to you know, be attacked. Um, if you kill one person, you know, how is it going to change? And then after your turn is done and after the red gets played, 
the next person gets to go and then the card gets flipped over and now yellow gets activated. So now it, it could be completely different from this last one. So like the first player on the, on the red, it went to the nearest player. Now the person here with the highest initiative on yellow, now they go directly to the last player that was activated. And sometimes like just based off of sheer luck, if you don't kill some of these guys, like there's multiple times where like we almost lost the game because I almost went unconscious because of how much damage they were doing. And we focused on the wrong bad guy because some of these things can be super brutal. And the other thing is, is that if you kill, let's say you kill off all the yellow guys and you only have red guys left. Well, now every single turn, red is activating. It doesn't go red and then yellow, even if there's no yellow on there. So like, you can really change the outcome of the campaign by killing off one of the yellow guys. And it can hurt. It can hurt really, really bad. Because like you can see here, you know, not every character has a bunch of shield like Sigin Sigin only has three shield whereas Korax has starts off with five so the asymmetric powers of all of these guys makes it super difficult to be able to understand like you know who should be doing what you know how things should, should be going if you have a person with low shield and low health and they accidentally you know you didn't plan correctly on the behavioral attacks like they could be dying quickly. And that was one of the things that I really enjoyed is that the, the variation between behavior attack cards, like they really thought this thing out to have like 30 different behavioral attack cards it definitely doesn't make this game go stale. So kudos on the behavior attack cards. One of the main reasons why I really enjoyed the strategy behind this game. The third reason why I really enjoyed this game now, we just talked about the behavior cards and we talked about taking damage. Now, I didn't think taking damage was gonna be such a big deal because going through like the first three, you're like, man, I didn't even get hit. You know, I, this is an easy game. We have shield, we, we got this. It's not gonna be hard. But the game gets difficult and boy, does it get hard because just a little bit of gameplay review. Other than your two basic cards that cost zero, your cards have a cost meter up here. So three and two and three. So if I was to play this three card, it has to go underneath my three slot. And the only way to get that card out of my three slot is to rest or to end my turn and you get one free rest action. Well, the damage that you take provides you with these fancy well done cards here. And they actually have numbers on the top left hand corner as well to tell you exactly where they go. So if I got this opened wound card that has a three, I'd have to slide it right here under there. And if I got this severe head trauma, that is also a three, guess what? Now it goes underneath here. And if for some reason I already had one in here and my board looked very similar to this, like I would not be able to play anything. I would force me to take a rest action to get this card out and to open up a fourth slot. And what you really don't want to do is put like your lower number cards, like your plasma gun, you're forced to put it all the way out here just to try to get these things to rest. So the way that they did these damage cards, I thought was just a brilliant way to make the game harder because it takes options away from you. It means that you cannot do things during the campaign. And if you can't do things during the campaign to make, you know, cause a lot of these bigger cards, can do some damage, can do, you know, help you out of a sticky situation. And these damage cards make it so that it makes it really challenging to be able to. One of the other things that I thought was super interesting is that we talk about how the game is a campaign game and it can change over and over again. Well, if you think that the game is too easy for some reason, there is a hard and an insane mode. And all of that is determined by these cards here. So you can see on the top of this card, it's, you know, when drawn, you place it under there, you place it under there. If you're on hard mode, you have an ongoing effect. So now I can do all of my cards that do damage have a range reduction of minus one. And then if it's on insane, when I discard this thing, when I finally get it out of there, I lose a shield. So like all of these things have, you know, a bunch of different bad things that can happen to you if you're on hard or in, 
or insane mode. And I thought that that was a really good way of making the game more difficult because if it wasn't hard already on normal mode, like you could essentially make this thing super challenging. And with with the game being over a thousand pages of like campaign, you have a bunch of replayability. You have the ability to go through this thing, you know, make different choices and see how your characters turn out. You know, God forbid that you, know, you make a lot of bad choices and you kill off your character. Well, now you no longer have that character and you have to go start a whole new character all the way from scratch and, you know, continue playing. So it does give you some options. And if you wanted it to be easier, harder or insane, if for some reason you wanted to do insane mode. All right. So I've talked about upgrading your guy multiple times throughout this. And let me just go ahead and talk a little bit about what upgrading actually looks like. So when we upgrade, you can see here that you have four different things to choose from. You have the red track, you have the green track, you have yellow and blue. And not every card, it's like your basic interact will have bonuses here, moves, but not every card has actual bonuses that you get from it. You can see here on your player mat, if I've done a very good job of actually not getting the glare out. So you can see that there has like these little waves. So you have yellow here, has all these whites and blue. So I have my green one upgraded and then I have my red here upgraded three different times if you can see that. Which means that I get basically three interact tokens, which are little tokens that sit here that lets me know that during this mission, when I play a card, so you can see here on this one, I can play this Titan Longsword. And when I play this Titan Longsword, I deal two unstoppable damage or unblockable damage to an adjacent enemy. And if I play any number of these, I add one damage to it. So if I'm going up against a guy that has four damage or four health, or uh, I could just go ahead and start adding these to it. And now I would do four damage on top of my dice roll. So then right here, so you would play the card, you roll your dice. I'm at three, he had a life, life of five. I had two more of these things. And then that is one way that you get to progress and you get to use as number of these as you have every single round or every single mission. They refresh at the end of the chapter is what I believe. Don't quote me on that, but but this this like feature where I'm making like my red better or I'm making my green better. Um, they have like different personality types, which is and it all but comes back to your choices that you make throughout the game. So those are the four things that I really enjoyed about this game today. You know, Rogue Angels, you know, it wasn't perfect by all means, but you know what? I, I don't know what perfect is for a campaign game because like I said at the beginning, I've never played a campaign game. This is my, my first dive into it. And for a first dive into campaign, like there was a lot of solid things that ha happened in here. Like they, I could tell that a lot of people at Sun Tzu and Emil put a lot of work into making this thing great. Like the story here alone, like I don't understand how they got a thousand pages of story. It just seems mind blowing that that that's how long the game can be and the fact that it has replayability all you know and 12 characters like there there's a lot going on here so good job over there guys um i do want to r remind everyone that this is a paid preview of this game but all of my opinions of this game everything that i talked to you about today was authentic and it was honest i truly did you know i had fun playing this game my wife who i wouldn't have thought enjoyed this actually really enjoyed it um to the point to where i think we might get to open up one of our other campaign games and uh start playing that one you know so all good things came out of this um if you want to see more game reviews or if you want to see more from me, uh, please feel free to give me a like and a subscribe. It does help me out a lot. I am Armando Castaneda. This is my channel between two meeples. I'll check you later.